Thank you, Dr. Lester and Dr. Johnson, for sharing your talents with us, for reminding us of the glorious promise of the passage that we will look at today, that as we abide in Christ, he has promised to abide in us as well. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we're grateful for the opportunity to be in this place and to worship you, no matter what we've done this week, no matter where we've come from, no matter who we are, in your grace today. You make open to us your very presence. And so, Lord, we pray that as we study your word together, that more than learning about you, we would be able to draw near to you. We would indeed abide in you. Lord, we pray today that the words of my mouth, the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it is indeed good to be back with you today. My family took a little spring break trip, like a lot of folks last week, went all the way to Colorado and back, and we drove. Uh, on the way there, we split it up quite a bit, but coming home, did 15 hours in one day. When we left Colorado, it was 14 degrees. By the time we made it to my in-laws in Weatherford, it was near 80. That's quite a difference in one day. And then when we pulled into Sugarland yesterday, it was not only warm, but humid. And I had just in a week forgotten what that could be like, I think. It is always amazing. For as much as driving like that can be difficult, it is gorgeous to see the world that God has made. From the mountains of Colorado to what is already here in Sugarland, Texas, a glorious springtime. If you don't know yet, the blue bonnets are already coming up. Gorgeous. So we drove that. To think in every place that we went, they're so different from one another, and yet in each and every place, the connecting thought is that this is a part of God's creation. And God has promised to meet us in these places. I've always loved springtime, love watching the flowers come up. I'm already trying to figure out how I can get away maybe in the next uh, week or two for a day to go take some pictures of all the wildflowers coming up. It's beautiful. And Alice and I have, throughout our marriage, enjoyed getting out and having a garden. When we first moved to Marlin, Texas, uh, we thought we were the best gardeners in the world. Uh, we didn't know that you didn't even have to do anything in Marlin, Texas. Things just grew on their own. Uh, but we had a little vegetable garden there, and we just could grow anything we wanted to. We put it in the ground, you know, put the seeds in there. We had corn and okra and peppers and lettuce. Uh, I mean, just everything. If, if we planted it, it grew. It was amazing. We just looked at ourselves and thought, aren't we great gardeners? Then we moved to West Texas. We tried to do the same thing in West Texas, but in West Texas, at least where we lived, you were only allowed to water. They didn't care if you had a garden or what. You were only allowed to water for an hour twice a week. That was it. And you couldn't split it up. You got your hour and you could water as much as you wanted in that hour, but then it was over. You, you couldn't even split it up 20 minutes, you know, for three days. You got an hour on Tuesday and an hour on Thursday. You better just get all the water going you could. I want you to know that's not a very easy way to have a garden. In fact, the only thing we could successfully grow there in uh, West Texas was squash. I like squash, but I don't like a lot of squash. <laughs> so after a while, we pretty much gave up on gardening there in West Texas. It's a frustrating thing to plant a garden that does not bear fruit. Apparently, that's true even for God. Look with me at John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. There Jesus gives us an image of God as frustrated gardener. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. 
This is the fourth sermon in the series on the I Am Statements of Christ that we find in the Gospel of John. Uh, This one is unique in that it's the only one of the six that actually reference the Father in heaven. Jesus declares that he is the true vine, and he goes on to call God the Father, not God the Father, but essentially God the Farmer. God the Farmer is on the lookout for good fruit. Specifically in this metaphor, he's on the lookout for grapes. He has a vine, a a vineyard, and he's hoping to find the fruit of that vineyard. And when he doesn't, what does he do in this passage? He pulls out the pruning shears. I'm kind of new to to some of the flowers that I have in my yard here. And so over the season that I was, I mean, over the winter, I was watching other people to see what they did with the plants here in Sugar Land. And I noticed that around Valentine's Day in my neighborhood, they went and pruned all the rose bushes. So even though I didn't know what I was doing, I went and pruned all of my rose bushes just because I thought that would be good. And you know what? It's apparently worked. They are looking good already. We came home to rose bushes full of blooms. This passage, God is ready to prune those branches that do not bear fruit. And I don't know about you, but if you're paying attention to this passage, that ought to make you a little nervous. Why? Because who are we in this passage? We are the branches. Jesus comes to us and talks about uh, the fact that the farmer uh, prunes uh, any branches that do not bear fruit. It's enough to leave you and me asking one another, how in the world do we make sure we produce good fruit. I've got good news for you. This passage is actually meant more as a word of encouragement than a word of warning because Jesus in this passage says to us, you do not produce fruit. That is Jesus's job, not ours. Our job is to do what in this passage? Remain in him. If we remain in him, it is the spirit of God, it is the work of Christ that brings forth fruit in our life. Look with me again at verses four and five. There Jesus makes clear, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, this is a promise. It's not a warning, it's a promise. If you remain in me and I in you, you will do what? You will bear much fruit. Then obviously with the warning, I mean with the promise is a slight warning, if you are apart from me, you can do nothing. I get that this really isn't revolutionary to most of us, the fact that we uh, are to remain in Christ to bear fruit. In fact, if I asked any of you today, what, what, where do we get the vitality of our Christian life? Where do we, uh, where do we find the life that, that we've been promised in Christ? We would say we find that life as we stay connected to Jesus. We have heard this over and over again. Intellectually, we know that we bear fruit in our lives as we remain connected to Jesus Christ our Lord. But here's the thing, almost all us religious people sometimes have trouble staying connected to the source of our life. It happened in Jesus' day and it happened in ours. Trouble is that Jesus is not, I mean, that God the Father is not always that easy to stay connected to. One, he's invisible. And it's not like having a, a conversation with your best friend. It's not, it doesn't give us the immediate feedback that we get on Facebook or other forms of social media that to abide in Christ, to remain in God, sometimes takes us beyond this world of instant gratification that, you, that we are used to. And the second thing is that we come to discover very quickly if we remain in Christ, he doesn't always do the things we want to. Isn't that frustrating? I mean, we sing songs about how good God is, and we believe that with all of our hearts, but, but we know that his goodness doesn't always come in the form we want it to come in. And frankly, that just makes God a little more troublesome than sometimes we want to deal with. We've been talking about this lately, that God doesn't often just endorse our plans. We have plans, good plans, plans for our family, plans for our church, plans for our country, plans for our businesses, and yet we know deep down inside our souls that if we take those plans to God in prayer, what is he apt to do? Leave them alone, bless them, put his rubber stamp on them? Is that how God works most often in our lives? It's not how he works in my life. So often when I take my plans to God, he looks at me and says, those are nice, Taylor, but you can lay those aside. I have different plans for you. We know that if we stay connected to God, God is apt to do that 
time and time again. When we're angry with someone, never taking those prayers to God. I mean, God invites us to, to just be honest with him, doesn't he? And so when I'm frustrated with somebody and I go to God in prayer and I, I, I know that God calls me to pray for my enemies, so that certainly must include those I'm frustrated with. And so if I go to God and pray for them, and we pray for them, don't we? God, help them to change their mind. Help them to see it my way. Help them to, I don't know, have just an ounce of common sense. God, come on, I am praying for this person. What happens as I pray those things is that often God, I mean, God's at work in their lives as well, but, but God eventually comes to me and says, do you let me worry about them? Now, here's what I want to do in your life. I want you to be more patient. I want you to be more gracious. I want you to learn how to forgive. God, those were not my plans. That's not why I came to you in prayer. And yet this is why we remain in Christ. And sometimes why we don't. When we're so frustrated with God because we think he will change our plans, we often are tempted to find substitutes for God. I don't think we do this consciously most of the time, but we look for things that are a lot like God, or at least are things of God, but but aren't as meddlesome as God. Kind of leave us alone. Let us do our own thing. In ancient Israel, that took a couple of forms. Uh, The first was simply the law. I want you to hear me well. The the law was a gift from God, but it was not God himself. Just like for us, the Bible is a gift from God, but it is not God himself. And sometimes it's easy for us to take the static words on the page, certainly was for ancient Israel, than to take the God that those words point to because the God the words point to are always leading us beyond our comfort zone. But if if we just stick with the words on the page, we can keep the ones we like and ignore the ones we don't and we can craft a law that's in our own image instead of the image of God ancient Israel could do that in ways that made themselves look good and others look bad so that they could just be content with who they were the second thing that they sometimes substituted for God was the nation itself because you can load up a nation with all sorts of self-serving plans that a sovereign God if you let him just might reject law and nation. The two things were so wrapped up in ancient Israel that it was hard to separate them. Together they gave most Jews of that day something to rally around, a cause, a purpose, a a common goal. A few things can really enliven us like that, to have a common goal, even to have a common enemy. When we read the New Testament, the Pharisees, they get a bad rap for us, but they were an energetic people. They were a people who were going after religious reform because they had a common goal. They wanted to live righteously. They had a common enemy, everyone who ignored the laws that they cherished so much. There's something about that that can cause us to be filled with energy. But Jesus here is warning, that is not an energy that brings life that it may for a moment give you the appearance of vitality, but it is not a vitality that endures, that you are like a branch that has been cut from the source because it's not the law that's the source of life. It's not the nation that's the source of life. Those are gifts from God, but they are not God himself, that where we find our life is in God alone. This is what Jesus says in this passage. Although he says it in such a radical way because he doesn't just say God the Father is the source of true life. He says what? I, I am the true vine. The vine in ancient Israel was a metaphor for the country itself. We miss this because it's not our metaphor, right? If I showed you a picture of vine, you wouldn't think anything. If I showed you a a picture of a bald eagle, what would you think? America, that's our symbol. Uh, We look at that and we think of our own nation. If I showed you a picture of a vine in ancient Israel, they would have felt that same thing that you just felt thinking about America. They would have thought, this is Israel. In Psalm 80, the psalmist declares, you, O God, transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took root and it filled the land. Its branches reached as far as the sea. It shoots as far as the river. The vine as a symbol of Israel showed up in all sorts of things. It was in the temple's architecture. It was on the coins that were minted during the Maccabean period. This is a period of, uh, a brief period of, of, Israel, uh, of, of Jewish independence. And so they had their own coins, and on those coins was the image of a vine. Israel came to think of their own vitality, depended upon having that nation established like in the days of David once more. It's not a bad idea, right? Good idea. 
good plan, something that would have been okay for them to think and want and pray for. But here Jesus shows up and upends the idea that the nation itself is the vine, true vine of God. He says, Israel isn't the true vine. I am. And apart from me, you can do nothing. Which really sounds ridiculous at first glance, wasn't it? I mean, they could do lots of things. They could try to obey the laws like the Pharisees were doing. They could try to overthrow the Romans like the Zealots were doing. They could do all sorts of things. But Jesus says, all of those things amount to nothing if you are not a part of me. Ancient Jews aren't the only ones that sometimes are tempted to think life revolves around something else other than our connection to Jesus Christ. We can too, can't we? We think our vitality comes from having the perfect family life. We work so hard just to make sure that our family, you know, looks like the, the images on the TV screen and, or, or, or our homes look like uh, what, what it looks like on, on our Pinterest board. And we think if we just get everything right, we will be alive. We think if we could just organize our communities correctly, if we could just get our people to win the right elections, if we could just get them in place and pass the laws in the way that we think would best serve us, we think if we could just get that done, we would have life. We think if our church could just get it together, if we could, if we could just get our program wide so that people wanted to come here, if we could just get you know, our property just like it needs to be, that then things would be well. We would have life. We have plans for our businesses. We have plans for our country. We think if we could just get all of the things in place, we would have life. And Jesus looks at all these good things and says, apart from me, you have nothing. Because true life is found only in one place. It's not found in any of our plans. It's found in Christ. Think after all about the kind of fruit that God is looking for. When we read the pages of the New Testament, what is it that that God is looking for when he goes looking for fruit? He isn't really looking for perfect families. We don't find a whole lot of those in the New Testament. I just want to be clear with you. When we read the Bible, I can't find a perfect family in there. That doesn't, if God's looking for that, he's not finding it. I don't even find communities that are perfect. I don't find churches that are perfect. I love when people say, let's get back to being the New Testament church. Have you read the New Testament? There are no perfect churches. I mean, if there were perfect churches, we wouldn't need all those letters from Paul. Well, why do we have all of those letters from Paul? Because the churches were terrible. They were filled with sinners who didn't know what to do. And Paul had to write them over and some of them over and over and over again to say, guys, this isn't what God is looking for. What kind of fruit is God looking for? Paul says in many different places. God is looking for compassion and mercy, forgiveness and love and gentleness, patience, forgiveness. This is the fruit that God longs for. And that fruit doesn't come from our planning, does it? That fruit comes from the very life of Christ dwelling within us. And we don't get that life by by coming up with the perfect plan. We get that life by remaining in Jesus, when we abide in him and he abides in us, his very nature begins to blossom from our lives. This helps us to remember, you and I don't bear fruit. We, 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 don't, we don't produce fruit. It's not like we, we sit in our lives and we think, okay, today I'm gonna be patient. I'm really gonna be patient. I'm gonna, how, how does that work for you? Does it work for you? It doesn't work for me. You know, when, when I'm sitting in traffic, it, it doesn't work for me just to think I'm going to be patient today. It, you know, it's not in my nature to do such things. But when I abide in Christ, when I remember that Christ is patient with me, when I simply focus on being in his presence, I find that sometimes there is a patience that I cannot explain, not because I am producing it, but because Christ is producing it in me. That what happens in our lives is not that we work and work and work and produce the life that God is looking for, but that by remaining in Christ, God is at work, at work, at work in us, bringing about his plans for our lives. See, the problem with taking our plans always to Jesus is that what we're really looking for is to graft Jesus onto our tree to stick with with the agricultural metaphor. So here's what you do when when you graft something. Again, I'm I did go to Texas A&M, but I do not have an ag degree, speech communication degree. 
But I've seen trees where they've grafted on. You have, a, you have a trunk and you take a branch from another tree and you graft it onto this tree and it draws its vitality from the tree. And, and the branch produces fruit or flowers or something that are, that are different than before. And so often what we want to do in our lives is we want to be the tree. And we want to take the Jesus branch and we want to make it one of the branches of our tree so that we can somehow borrow a little of the vitality of Christ in our lives. But that's not the way trees work. Are they? I mean, trees don't work that way. The trunk does not get the vitality from the branch. The branch gets the vitality from the trunk. And every time we have our plans and say, okay, Jesus, I need you to be a branch in my life so that my plans will succeed, we are missing the way it works. Jesus is not a branch grafted into our life. We are a branch grafted into his In order for our life to to bear the vitality and the fruit of Jesus, we must be grafted into him so that that his life and his power becomes the source of our own. But to do that means we must give up. We must give up really control of our plans, trusting that the plans that will bless us most are the plans of Christ. Only when we find ourselves grafted in him Will we know such a life? This is why Jesus taught us to pray most fully, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not always God make my plans succeed. It's God, what are your plans? And how can I be a part of them? How how do we abide in Christ though? It's, It's an easy thing to say that we should abide in Christ. But how do we do it? Now I know you'd love some secret answer today. But it's really the answer the church has been giving over and over again. We abide in Jesus by reflecting on his word and by meeting him in prayer. And we know this in our heads. And we think, well, I, you know, it just doesn't seem to work. Well, it doesn't seem to work because actually most of us have not done it very much. Because it's just not as easy to do as many of the things that we like to do. It's much easier just to scroll through our Facebook feed all day, but then I want you to know what you're abiding in when you do that all day. And I do it too. We're abiding in our friends' lives. And we've got good friends. And I, you know, many of you are my Facebook friends. So it's not that we have bad friends on Facebook, but you are not the vine. You're just other branches. And guess what? I'm not the vine either. So if the only way you abide in Christ every week is to show up and to listen to my sermon, that's good. I'm glad you show up and listen. You know, it makes me feel better about myself when you show up. But, you know, I am not the vine. And if this is the only 25 minutes of of, of abiding in Christ you get all week, guess what? You are not remaining in Christ. To abide in him is to seek his presence wherever we go. Now you think, Taylor, I can't read my Bible all day. I mean, you're not supposed to text and drive. I'm guessing you're not supposed to read and drive either. You know, how, how could we do that? It, the key is to spend time with God in ways that you can carry with you all day long. That, that we abide in him by spending time in his word and by meeting him in prayer. And then we carry that with us along the way. For Jesus here isn't mediated through a preacher. Uh, He isn't mediated certainly through the people we see on TV or through a political pundit, that that we must meet him. And here's the good news of the gospel, that if we seek him, he promises that he will be found. Now, lots of different ways of doing this. So so I'm not gonna prescribe one way to to read your Bible and to pray. There's lots of different ways. We have different personalities. Some people wanna do this the very first thing when they get up in the morning. Other of you, if you do that, you won't remember any of it because you fall asleep over and over again. Uh, Other people may wanna do this at the end of the day. I encourage you, if you do this at the end of the day, to also still have some mechanism by which you remember what you read the night before the next morning. Uh, There's lots of different ways to read your Bible. So so I'm going to give you one way this morning to think about using this week, but hear me well. This is not the one way. There's not one way. There's lots of different ways. But the key is for us to read God's Word, not in a way that checks it off the box. We've all done that before, right? We want to read read through the Bible in a year. My church in San Angelo, we read through the Bible in 90 days one time. You talk about reading a lot. That's a lot. And check it off the box. You may not remember anything you read, but you check off the box. That's not what we're going for here. We want to read God's word in a way that we do what? Abide in Christ. That we seek his presence. That we're we're on the lookout. It's not a check to go in our to-do list. But we are after the very presence of Christ. 
One of the ways Christians have been doing this for, for really centuries is a method of reading the scripture called Lectio Divina. Now, that sounds really fancy because it's in Latin, but it really just means divine reading. We might just call it reflective reading. All it means is, you know, really in practical purposes, is slow reading. If you're like me, I've, I, you know, I've grown up in the church. I've read the Bible a lot. My parents read it to me. We went to church. I've learned all the stories. I've, I've been to seminary. I have a, a doctorate in it. I've read the Bible. And so my tendency is when I read the Bible, what do I do? I, I read in the first three couple of verses. I'm like, I've read this before. You know? And I don't do that consciously, but in my head, I'm like, I already know what this means. Guess what? That's not the way we meet Christ. We believe that the Spirit of God shows up when we read the Bible and that he has a fresh word for us every single day. And if you go to the Bible and you think, well, I've I read this before, you're probably not going to meet the Spirit's presence. And so what Lectio Divina does is it slows you down a little bit. And really, it's, all, it's really meant to be done out loud in some ways. And so a lot of times it'll be done with a group of people and you'll have one person who simply reads it out loud that may not be practical in your life the good news is for all the bad things that happen with technology today one of the marvelous things is you have more access to the bible today than the world has ever known and and you can get on and not only can you get the bible in all sorts of different translations and languages you can have it read to you and I've actually gotten to a point in, in much of my, my devotional time where to keep me from just looking at the page and going, yeah, I know what's on this page, I like to listen to the scripture. And so I can type in whatever little part of the scripture that I'm going to reflect on that day, and it will, you know, the little robot voice, I don't know, will read it to me. And it, it just changes it for me. I, it may not work for you, but for me it changes it. And in Lectio Divina, you, depending on which way you're doing it, you'll, you'll either read or listen to it three times or four times. The first time, you're just hearing it. You, you just want to listen. And so you, you have the text read, and, and you listen for it. it. You focus on the passage as if it was for the first time. So, so you do your very best to not think, I've heard this before. You do your very best to hear it anew. And you just listen. And after you listen, you, you just sit in silence for a little bit. You're trying to to put aside all of our bad habits of rushing past the voice of God. Then you listen to it again. And this time as you listen, you reflect and you ask God's spirit to bring out maybe a word or a phrase from the passage. If we were to read this passage, then maybe you would listen to it and and just maybe the word abide if you're in the old King James or remain if in the text we, maybe that sticks out to you, remain, remain in me. And you just allow that phrase to sink in your soul and you you begin to wonder what God wants to to say to you through that phrase today. How how does God want to meet you in that phrase? And again, you sit in silence for a while. Then you listen to it a third time. This time you offer it back as a prayer to God. So if if out of this passage, for instance, you've said, you know, I've been rushing through my days almost, almost in mindlessness. God, help me to abide in you today in everything I do. And maybe as you're listening to it, you know what you have that day. And so you say, you know, I've got my meeting with my boss and I just want to be honest, God. I don't ever really think of you when I'm meeting with my boss, you know, other than maybe could you bring some hellfire and brimstone down, Uh, you know. God, help me to abide in you even in that meeting. Help me to know your presence even even in what I know will be a frustration. See how it's different? We're meeting God in the pages of the scripture. We're allowing the pages of the scripture to influence our day. And then if you want to listen to it one more time, it's just to rest in it. Just to say, God, the goal of this life is not for me to do, 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 but the, the goal is for me to remain in you. And you hear the scripture one more time, maybe focusing on the promises it brings. And then if you just want to stick with the R's, you read, you reflect, you respond, you rest. The last one is really just remember. That if you've done that in the morning, if you've read that scripture four times. So again, we're not talking massive amounts of scripture. You pick a small passage. Then you just want to remember it throughout the day. When you find yourself in a new place, what does that word that God spoke to me this morning say to me today in this moment? How do I, how do I re- abide in Christ today? If we remain in Christ in this way, Jesus says. This is the glorious promise of this passage. If we'll remain in Christ, the reading of his word, through meeting him in prayer, through thinking about him all day, he says that we can ask anything in Christ's name and it will be given to you. Now, before you start praying that your person will get elected in this next election or that you can somehow, Chris, I don't know if you're a gardener, but if you want to pray that God will give you tomatoes in San Angelo, I just want you to know this passage says if we ask anything in Christ's name. 
Which means if we've been abiding in him, what are the kind of things we will be asking for? We will be asking for the things of his kingdom. And that's not a dodge on that promise. Because the truth is the things that most of us ask for time and time again, they're the things of this earth. They're the things that are passing away. And what Christ is inviting us to ask for is something even more. He's asking you to to say, God, give me patience. God, give me grace. God, give me mercy. God, give me kindness. God, give me joy in this heartbreaking world. God, give me the things of the kingdom come even as I continue to live in these kingdoms that are passing away. Jesus says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, ask those kind of things and I'll give it to you. Because guess what? Even more than we want to bear the fruit of the kingdom, God wants to bring forth the fruit of the kingdom in you and in me. All we have to do is abide in him along the way. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we are grateful for the promises of the kingdom. That, Lord, I know when I look over my life, that left to my own devices, there is not much fruit. In fact, the fruit of my life when lived in my own power is really the fruit of this kingdom. It's, it's a fruit of impatience. It's a fruit of being judgmental. It, it, it's a fruit of, of greed and, and, Lord, even idolatry. Lord, what a transformation comes when I abide in you. That, Lord, the fruit I bring forth is not the, the fruit that's natural to me, but it is the fruit of your kingdom come. Lord, this occurs in our lives not because of anything you, we do, but because of what you are doing in us. So, Lord, we pray today that we would be a church that would bear the fruit of your kingdom come. That we would do that, not by making grand plans, but, Lord, by abiding in you every single day. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today who is really tired of trying to live under their own power, they've, they've seen the fruit of that kind of living and they want no more of it, Lord, I pray today that they give their heart to you, that they know what it means to be grafted into your vine they would be able to bear much fruit in your kingdom from this day forth. Lord, I pray that they come and make that decision today. Lord, we pray that each of us would take this moment as a moment to abide in you and to end this moment ask you to help us to do that all week long. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.